Take a deep breath. Just breathe for a second. Feel your chest expand as you breathe in. Feel the exhale. We all know what it feels like to breathe. We do it about 20,000 times a day. But very few of us know what's actually in the air we're breathing. In a room like this, beyond the nitrogen and oxygen that make up the stuff we call air, there's so much more in every breath. There's some chemicals from the carpets and the paints. There's some carbon dioxide from your neighbor that just exhaled. There's maybe even some bacteria from the few people I heard coughing a while ago. We don't often think about indoor air because we've been told to focus on air quality outside. Only now we're coming to understand the importance of air inside. There's an entire movement today focused around the concept of indoor wellness. And I'm here today to share with you why I think all of indoor wellness begins with air. I became convinced of this a few years ago when the company I founded was hired to help a pretty famous retail store in Shanghai take stock of the health of their indoor air. Now, we do this kind of work all the time. In fact, we're the largest consulting company in the world helping retail stores get LEED certified. LEED is the industry standard for green building certification. Anyway, to the store owners, everything seemed normal. This was just a routine check. But what we found shocked them. One of the worst pollutants that we know is what's called ultra-fine particulates, or PM2.5. If you live in a city like I do, you'll know these particulates really well because when they're really bad outside, the government has to take drastic measures like reducing traffic, shutting down schools, and warning people to stay indoors. All I want you to know about particulates right now is that when they're really bad outside, they're usually pretty obvious. Here's a very famous photo of a police officer in China during what in Asia have become called the air apocalypse events that are happening every year now. But this, this is what pollution looks like outside. Inside, like in the store we were working with, particulates are impossible to see. To give you a sense of how bad the air was in this store, the scale that we use to measure particulates goes from zero to 500 micrograms per cubic meter, where zero is perfectly clean air and 500 is incredibly toxic. The World Health Organization has set the safe level for these particulates at 25. When we first got the test results back from the store, the air was so bad that it maxed out our equipment. Everything just read 500. The levels were literally off the charts. Now, of course, the store owners had no idea what was going on. They were selling high-end clothing, after all, and not smokestacks. So my team got to work. And what we uncovered was that the mall where the store had just recently opened was undergoing heavy renovation at nighttime. And at nighttime, all those particulates from the construction were coming in and settling inside our store. Once we discovered this, the solution was easy. We decided to keep the ventilation system running overnight, and that created enough positive air pressure to keep those particulates from coming in and accumulating in the first place. And the difference between before we'd found the problem and after we'd solved it, it was just incredible. The air became healthy again. Now, what I took away from this experience is that most of us just don't know enough about indoor air. We don't know what's in the air we breathe. We don't know how bad air is making us sick. And therefore, we don't know what to do about it. My goal in the next few minutes is to give you everything that you need to know to start fixing your indoor air today so that all the spaces where you live your lives are cleaner, healthier, and happier. Okay? All right. So what do I mean by indoor air quality? The three most common pollutants in the spaces where you and I live our lives are these. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, volatile organic compounds, we'll call them VOCs for short, and particulates, which we just met. Each three has a different source, and each has a different solution. CO2 is what you might call human pollution, because the bulk of it comes from us. Every time we exhale, we're throwing a little bit of it into the air. Now, CO2 is not necessarily a problem, which is good because we're constantly making this stuff and it's all around us. CO2 is only a problem when there's too much of it. 
If you're in a building with poor ventilation, all that CO2 that you and everyone else is exhaling gets trapped inside the building, causing a variety of health effects like fatigue and impaired decision making. A recent study from Harvard found that just a moderate rise in CO2 caused test scores to drop by 20%. Imagine that. 20% of your brain power lost just because of the room that you're in. But the other two pollutants, they make CO2 look pretty mild in comparison. CO2 basically just makes you tired. Things like particulates and VOCs will actually kill you, given enough of them and enough time. Uh, how many people know that new car smell whenever you get into a new car or a new Uber? Okay, a few of you. I have a feeling some of you are afraid to answer because you know what I'm about to say, right? But we know that new car smell. It can smell good, clean, fresh. It can smell like progress. Well, that new car smell is the result of what we call off-gassing, which is what happens when all those new car parts start releasing the chemicals that were used to make them. And those chemicals are called VOCs. Now, not all VOCs are bad. The smell of a freshly sliced apple or a nice perfume are all examples of VOCs. But some VOCs, like those found in some carpets and paints and furniture, those VOCs can hurt you, potentially causing organ damage or even cancer. And there's no safe level of a harmful VOC. There's no, oh, it's all right if you're just below this number. Even a little bit will do you some harm. The last threat, which we've already met, is particulates. So if VOCs kill you slowly, particulates will kill you quickly. The reason why we're told to stay indoors during those air apocalypse events is because our lungs can't filter particulates that are smaller than 2.5 microns. They go directly into our bloodstream, directly into our organs, wreaking all sorts of havoc. An increasing number of studies are suggesting the link with dementia in the elderly and delayed brain development in children directly because of PM 2.5. So in short, these pollutants are nasty and they're everywhere, but they're not the real problem. They're not the real problem because once we know to detect them, we have the technology to remove them. The real problem isn't the particulates themselves, but rather our lack of knowledge about them. We don't know enough about the air in our schools, our homes, our offices, and because we don't know enough, we're not doing enough to fix what ails us. Everything, in the end, comes back to knowledge. So let's unpack that knowledge problem. Why don't we know what's in our air? The first solution is the simplest. Indoor air is invisible. When the air is really bad outside, it's usually really obvious. There's a fog or a bad smell or it's hard to breathe. But indoors, it's a different story. Unless you have good monitoring equipment, there's no way to tell if your air is good or bad. There's no way to guess. There's no rule of thumb. It requires hardware that measures data. So the crucial reason why indoor air is such a mystery is that it's invisible. But the causes are more complex than this. Because some building managers know that there's a problem, but don't do anything to fix it. And there can be lots of reasons for this. Sometimes, good monitoring equipment isn't cheap and the cheapest monitors aren't any good. CCTV a couple of years ago did a study that showed that the cheap monitors like those we'd buy online had a 100% failure rate. All failed, none were accurate. But suppose that a building did have a good monitoring system in place. Do you think the managers would understand what it told them? And what if it told them that they needed to make significant changes to the ventilation system? Would they be willing to pay that expense? Because I'm constantly working with these people, showing them how a healthy indoor environment can be good for their business, I am convinced that the costs are worth it. Employees are happier. They get sick less often. They're more productive. Customers enjoy their space more, and so on and so on. But if someone is only just looking at the bottom line, that can often be hard to see. Now, don't get me wrong. Most of the managers I work with want to do what's best for their people. This is not the story about the little guys against the large corporations. But what the business and building world is missing, however, are the tools, the training, the data, in other words, the knowledge, to help these decision makers understand the problem. 
So let's talk about data and how to use it. Because if the problem is lack of knowledge, which creates lack of action, then we need to learn to get good data and we need to learn how to use it. And I have some good news for you. The CCTV study I mentioned a moment ago, that had a happy ending. After those results came out, a standard called RESET, which defines how accurate these monitors should be, has become wildly popular. And best of all, RESET lets us rank those monitors according to their accuracy, such as grade A, grade B, or grade C. So my recommendation to you here today can be really simple. Buy a certified grade A or B monitor. That's all that you and your teams need to know to make sure you're getting good data. And I brought one of those grade B certified monitors here today. And it's currently showing that our indoor air in this room right now is 17 micrograms. So we're all safe. <laughs> but it's not enough to gather just a bunch of numbers. We need to understand what that data is saying. We need to see the story it's telling us about the health of our space. And this is where it starts to get really exciting. Because there's a lot of innovation happening today that is making that data useful and practical. From a building certification point of view, we have the well building standard that is leading the way, teaching us how to design and operate spaces to maximize the health and well-being of our occupants. And I mentioned LEED in the beginning. They just recently launched a bold new product called ARC, which lets users track the sustainability of things, of their spaces, like air, uh, air quality, energy, and water usage. And best of all, ARC lets projects compare their statistics against other projects around the world. Think of like a video game scoreboard for sustainability, and you got the idea. And we're now also able to move beyond rating systems to use that data to stop problems before they start. My own company uses a software called Clear, which lets projects track air quality in real time, but more importantly, across time. The basic idea is, is that if projects can learn to be more proactive instead of reactive about their indoor environments, it will always remain as healthy as can be. So, for example, the retail store that I mentioned in the beginning. This is what Clear was showing us when we first started monitoring. You can see at the very top of the graph where our equipment was maxing out at 500, where that hazardous red band is. And all the way down there at the bottom where that green band is, that's the safe level from the WHO. And here is what that same graph looks like today. That's the same green band, just zoomed in. And because we're continuing to monitor the air quality, the air has remained healthy. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Uh, this is all great, but there's no way that my boss will give me control over the ventilation system like you did with that retail store. And I know how hard it can be. I often work in buildings that have hundreds of offices inside or even large school campuses. And I know how difficult it is sometimes to just get the temperature right, you know? But it's because of those experiences that I can tell you that it is possible. Change can be made. It just requires some gentle and persistent encouragement from all of us. And those same principles that apply to us as, uh, to apply to buildings, apply to us as individuals too. Our work also starts with knowledge. And you can put that knowledge to good use. Ask your building manager or school facilities managers to see the monitoring data. And if they don't have it, suggest that they get one of those grade A or grade B monitors. And you can all monitor the air in your home too. There's excellent monitoring options for homes that are reasonably priced. And when you get the chance to build or renovate, look for certified green materials like no VOC paints, low VOC furniture, or certified flooring such as this. And for rooms that you've already furnished, there's some simple steps we can take to improve our air. First is these little guys. Plants can be a cheap and pretty fun way to clean our air. We've known since NASA started researching this in the 1980s that plants do an incredible job at scrubbing the air for things like VOCs. And of course, plants survive by taking in carbon dioxide and breathing out fresh oxygen. And they help with mood and productivity. So get lots of plants. Second, if the air is good outside, open your windows. That lets CO2s and VOCs out. 
And there's apps that you can download anywhere in the world that tell you how good the air quality is. Lastly, invest in filtration, like a standalone air purifier. Filtration technology these days does an incredible job at removing everything from particulates to even cigarette smoke. So in short, there's a lot of simple steps that we can take to make sure our indoor environments are actually making us healthier. Air is a strange thing. We can't see it, but it's everywhere, and it's essential for life. Now, it's okay if some of you are freaked out after learning how this transparent stuff that's all around you might be killing you. And we should all be on alert. But I'd like to close with some reassurance. There are two extremes that we want to avoid. On one hand, because air is invisible, it's easy to ignore, and that's dangerous. But on the other hand, just because it can be dangerous doesn't mean we need to be afraid of it. My goal today has not been to scare you. I'm not scared about the air quality in my own home or office because I've taken the practical steps that I've talked about. And we can all do the same for all our spaces. It just requires a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of effort. And what gives me hope about this new movement of indoor wellness is that we can all learn to make our indoor environments cleaner, healthier, and happier. And that starts by improving the stuff we breathe. Air might be invisible, but it doesn't have to be a mystery. Thank you very much.